Hello folks, welcome to Rational Science. And today we're going to be talking about the second. But before we get to the second, let's go to first. And we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit about extinction, subjects related to extinction. And we start with a uh, little uh, note that came out there uh, related to the Ukrainian war. Now, for those of you who are not aware, uh, the, there was a Ukrainian war until recently, and it's over now. So if you missed it, well, you've got to go back in history to find out what it was all about. Yeah, the, the war in Ukraine is over, and it's over because all the fun has already happened. Now it's just a war of attrition. Now it's uh, just throwing bombs, destroying cities. I'm not sure that's going to change very much. Uh, maybe they reach an agreement, finally shake hands, and, uh, you know, uh, they all try to come out as if they won the war. That's typical, if, if they reach some kind of a truce. But the war is over. All the fun is over. All the uh, uh, penalties, all the things that they were going to do, you know, that's already happened. Right now, I think it's just going to be the same old, same old every day. Unless, which I doubt, uh, they uh, start pressing those red buttons. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, my guess on that, my my take. Um, but if that happens, we're all in trouble. <laughs> then uh, extinction will happen a little sooner than what I thought. But uh, no, if uh, things continue as they are now, um, it's just going to be a war of attrition. And essentially, the winner here is the United States. It's the only country that has won here. Uh, Russia has lost uh, already. Ukraine has lost already. Europe, as, as a continent, has lost already. The only winners, uh, China also, I think, has lost to some degree, okay, because they're going to be applying a little bit of pressure on the Chinese. I think the only country that really comes out on top here is the United States. So it was a good move, very uh, sagacious uh, move on the part of the United States government. Uh, whether it's going to have some long-term consequences, uh, we don't know. Um, you know, it's anybody's guess. But anyways, here's the uh, little note, little headline that uh, happened this week that caught my eye. Okay, and I want to comment on this. Okay, uh, Biden says, uh, warns of real food shortage risk over Russia's invasion into Ukraine. And he warned on Thursday that there would be global food shortages resulting from the Russian invasion of Ukraine and announced steps to prevent a potential crisis. Okay, We did talk about food shortages, and it's going to be real. The price of these sanctions is not just imposed upon Russia. It's imposed upon an awful lot of countries as well, including European countries and our country as well, Biden said. Uh, both Russia and Ukraine, for example, are providers of wheat, though he pointed out that the U.S. and Canada are also major wheat producers. Okay? And the president announced his intention to redouble combined efforts with the European Union to increase global food security, provide direct food aid where warranted to prevent a crisis in a joint statement, et cetera, et cetera, right? The president said NATO leaders talked about urging all European countries and everyone else to end trade restrictions on limitations on sending food abroad, okay? And the uh, U.S. and its allies, Biden said, are in the process of working out how to alleviate food shortage concerns and rising inflation and lingering uh, supply chain issues, okay? And uh, so why do I raise this issue? Well, as you know, I'm saying that uh, the extinction of man is going to come as a result of food. And some people might look at this article or something similar or another article similar to this and say, oh, Bill, there's your theory. Uh, food shortages. Uh -uh. <laughs> okay, I want to, that's what I want to clarify. This is not about my theory at all. Okay, this has to do with the United States trying to push Russia and Ukraine aside, both countries, so that it can supply the world with more wheat. Okay, This has to do with business, with politics, uh, not with my theory. My theory is, says something a little different. Okay, It says that money will be no more. Money will collapse. Nobody will believe in money. Nobody will accept money, any kind of money. 
They won't accept gold. They won't accept uh, Bitcoin or any crypto coin. They won't accept uh, dollars or euros. Nobody will accept money, okay, because the global economy has collapsed. Because nobody accepts money, no one produces food, especially the corporations that today uh, produce and distribute food, and therefore food doesn't get to where it has to go, which is to the cities. Uh, the cities starve to death, primarily the cities, but just about everyone who depends on buying their food. Uh, you know, suddenly there, there's no food to buy because there's nothing to buy it with because nobody will accept whatever you offer them. That's the theory. So when these people talk about food shortages, we're talking about something else. We're talking about politics. We're talking about business. We're talking about um, uh, moving Russia out of the picture so that the United States can take that same spot. Same with energy. Same with uh, weapons. You know, the United States now compelled Germany to buy or to invest $112 billion in um, uh, uh, military equipment, defense, and guess who they're going to buy it from? <laughs> guess who the seller is going to be? Uh, how about wheat? Same thing. Who's going to sell it? Hey, Canada and the United States, uh, and so on and so forth. So what this war means for the United States is is a big coup that coup overall, you know, on the on the market. Uh, the United States is hoping to take the spot that Russia had at least with Europe, okay, and possibly even with other countries. So it's not it's got little to do with my theory. My theory is something different. My theory says again that the economy, global economy, has to collapse first. Okay. Why will it collapse? Well, a series of reasons, maybe a couple of them to mention, is one, population is not increasing at the rate it has been in the past. It's the uh, global uh, growth rate, global growth rate, world, right? Total population of the world, right? The global growth rate is steadily coming down, okay? And that's, that's important, steadily. No longer like what happened in the 14th century. People say, well, we had a crash in the 14th century. We recovered. This is something totally different. In those days, population was young. Today, the population is old. The reason we're not having children, the reason the growth rate is going down, is we're old and we moved to the cities. And there's issues of economics and culture as well, but those would be the primary ones. And, and then the other one is that, you know, uh, the jobs we're creating are not jobs. Okay? When you create a job in the service industry, you're not creating much of a job. But when you create them within the service industry, in the Internet business, in the Internet world, uh, you're talking about ads, you're talking about entertainment. That's not work. Not at all. Okay? So we're creating that kind of work, which is not work for real. And again, like I say, you know, if you're standing up there with God looking at the world, right, what do you see? Well, what you see is what's there, what exists. What you see are the railroads, you see the bridges, you see the houses, you even see the food being grown in the fields, maybe the cows. What you don't see are the services. What you don't see are the internet services. You don't see entertainment. There's no such thing that you can see out there called entertainment. You just see someone moving his hands, that's all. And you don't see any product from that, just maybe a smile, <laughs> entertainment, what is that? So, um, you know, when you create internet jobs, you're not creating jobs at all. So we're not creating jobs, that's the problem, okay? And so that together with the fact that we're moving from the country to the city, process known as transition, we're becoming urbanites, there's this Global movement, global, okay? Every country uh, is becoming urbanized, okay? People are abandoning the farms, the lands, the big tracts of lands, and those are being bought out by the few corporations that mass produce food and deliver them to the cities. So this process is going on everywhere, and we can't stop it. It's because it's in the self interest of the corporations <laughs> to do it. Uh, a lot of the uh, farmers, they have no choice because they had debt and they can't pay for it, so they sell their land. Others prefer the lifestyle in the city, especially the new generations. 
So that transition is unstoppable. There's no way you can overturn that and go back to the country. Now, people say, well, well, some people go to the country. Yeah, usually they go to the villages because they don't like the hustle and bustle of the city. But it's not like they're going to be farmers. They're going to smaller towns, but they're living just like they lived in the city. Instead of living in an apartment, they live in a house. That's all the only difference. But it's not like they're going to the fields to produce food. That's, that's what I mean. They're not being subsistence farmers by any, mean, by any chance of the imagination. So, yeah, the theory uh, of extinction has to do with food, but it's got nothing to do with uh, the scarcity of food, which is being produced now. And part of, it, part of that scarcity has to do with raising prices. Uh, I was keeping track here in Germany. You know, uh, I go to the store and I'm paying for, um, um, what is it, uh, for a couple items that I buy, veggies, okay, uh, and I'm paying 20 more cents in just a month. And that amounts to 20% uh, of the price that I was paying before. So the prices are going up. You have this inflation going up. And suddenly, you know, the, uh, especially the uh, salary person, the uh, people, the um, proletariat, uh, you know, w w all they can do is live off of their salary. And if their salary has less value at the store, among other places, right? Well, you can see what's, what's happening here. Until they catch up to the new prices, to the inflation, well, it's going to take a while. You know, there, there might be strikes and who knows what else in between. Uh, certainly, a lot of the unions are going to fight their loss of wages, their real loss of wages. Right? Okay, anyways, uh, moving on here. A uh, fellow says, do governments have to build cities? Why not private corporations instead? I mentioned the fact that, um, you know, uh, governments, I'll, I like to pick on two of them. I'll pick on three or four maybe. We, we have land in Australia, we have land in Canada, we have land uh, for sure in Brazil and Argentina. These are big countries, Russia, okay? And so you have all this land, it's empty land. And you say, well, you know, I mean, we're just talking about numbers, okay? We're not talking about quality here, we're just talking about volume, right? Well, we could fill those lands with more and more people, right? So one of the things we could do is uh, put people in those places, create new cities. And who can do that except government? Okay? The government would have to implement some kind of policy or create some kind of incentive, especially for the youth, for the young people, to go out there, you know, to the middle of Siberia or in Argentina to the middle of Patagonia, right, in the middle of nowhere and say, okay, go ahead, build a city. <laughs> you know, the era of colonization is over. Governments can't do that. They can't force people to go out there and build cities. So this fellow is saying, well, how about corporations? What if corporations somehow create, you know, cities somehow, okay? After all, you've got uh, something similar happened to Detroit, you know, where uh, the car industry was installed there and uh, people flocked over there because of jobs and became a big city, right? So, you know, and there are other examples around the world. But the question is, uh, California, you know, gold rush and so on. Uh, so what kind of gold rush can we create? Uh, and you want to put government aside, go ahead. What um, gold rush can uh, corporations create for people to go in the middle of Siberia or in the middle of Canada up north there or in the middle of the uh, desert over there in Australia and say, oh, we're going to found a new city. You know, I claim it for the Queen of Spain. Put your flag in there. <laughs> Is that ever going to happen again? Or has the era of colonization come and gone? And I'm saying corporations have no way of uh, incentivizing and in, in creating incentives for, especially for the young people, to go in, in the middle of nowhere and create a city. It's the other way around. People are moving from the country to the cities because they like the hustle and bustle. It's a place where the youths, at least they, they have opportunities uh, maybe to develop their careers and so on. That's where the universities are, et cetera, et cetera. All of it is in the cities. So, no, so it's the other way around. The youth are leaving the country. You know, their parents stay, stay behind, but they say, no, I'm going to go to the city. And so all the youths are essentially coming to the city first to study, then to get jobs there, 
and you know then you get stuck with a job you're not going to go out into the country in the middle of nowhere and, you know with your <laughs> shovel and uh, your pig and, and start uh, creating you know a new a new uh, city a new village it, it doesn't happen and i'm not sure what any corporation can do let alone the government right uh to create some kind of interest especially in the new generations for people to go out there Quite the contrary, I would say that people would rather go into apartments, play with their computers, and, you know, pass the time away. <laughs> so I don't think people are interested in going to the farms. And, and I'm sure that if you told 90% of the young people today, anywhere from 15 to 30 at least, to go out into the country and um, settle there, I don't think that one would go there. Okay. Everybody's abandoning, young people, they're, they're abandoning the country. So, no, uh, I don't know. Give me, give me a, a mechanism or some kind of uh, incentive that the companies can give to lure people into the country. Now, you might say, uh, I don't know, one possibility is a corporation creates a, um, a plant in the middle of nowhere. Well, that already is very odd. You know, I don't think too many companies will want to go into the middle of nowhere with no roads, no way of getting to the cities and just put a plant there and say, OK, people, come here and work for us. You know, usually corporations look at uh, where are they going to put a plant? I know this uh, from working at AMD and they look at places where you have education, where you have good roads, where you have good tax breaks and all these things that they take into consideration before moving or putting a new plant, you know, a new uh, fabrication area or whatever into a new place, into a new city. And usually, I, I'd say 99% of the time, if not 100, they go to cities. They don't go to the middle of nowhere. They don't go in the middle of the desert and say, we're going to install our plant here. No way. It, not, it doesn't happen these days, at least. You know, maybe in the old days, days of the cowboys. Kansas, you know, in the middle of Nebraska, yeah, could happen. Not today. Okay, uh, fellas, uh, Guillermo is a myopic, pedantic pessimist. I resent that. Uh, uh, I resent the pessimist and the myopic. Uh, pedantic, I'll accept. <laughs> Believing we run out of conceptual measure like money leading into extinction isn't realistic. Well, again, uh, like I said the other day, uh, we have to uh, differentiate a um, pessimist from a realist, okay? And that's the first thing we have to distinguish. In other words, pessimist is not a, a realist. A realist is someone who can explain to you something and say objectively, okay? And so that's what I try to do with extinction. A pessimist is just a guy that, without necessarily having a reason, says, oh, the world's coming to an end. You know, yeah, that could be a pessimist. Uh, and again, it's different than a realist who would explain why the world is coming to an end. And again, I gave the example last time, one of the examples I gave, a guy falling from an airplane. Okay? And we see him, you know, the door opens somehow and the guy just fell off, right? One of the passengers. And so you see him falling and you say, oh, that guy's going to die. You're such a pessimist, Bill. <laughs> No, no, it's not pessimism. I, mean, you know, I think that's quite realistic to think that the fellow is going to die. Okay? So, yeah, I like to distinguish pessimist from realist. I'm saying I'm a realist. Uh, I give an ex objective um, explanation of why uh, humans are coming to an end. And it's got to do also with, with the past. Uh, what I do is look at how did extinctions happen in the past, the ones that we can certify. You know, we see those bones in the mountain in the middle of the rock, right? And we say, okay, here's a dinosaur. Further down, what do we see? Maybe a, um, I don't know, a, uh, an archosaur. Further down, you go and you see a synapsid. And further down, you get an amphibian. So they're all in the different layers of rock. Okay, so you say, well, okay, how, how long did this take? Well, so many millions of years. And so we say, well, these animals are not around anymore. And we look at their bones, uh, try to make an image of what that animal looked like. And we say, well, these animals don't exist anymore. So those were extinctions. Okay? And so I try to explain 
what happened at each stage, you know. And I'm saying Mother Nature has only one mechanism for extinction, one and only one. And that mechanism of extinction is food. It's known as economics. People say economics. Economics has to do with supply and demand curves and prices and and labor and in interest rates. Uh uh. That's uh, man's particular economics. Mother Nature's economics is a little broader, okay? And it only, only has to do with food, also for humans, okay? We manage all this stuff, all the, we do computers, we do uh, cars, we sell cars, we do uh, internet, we do all this stuff. Why do we do it? So that we can eat and live one more day. Without eating, without that food, we're dead. So we need food. All the rest is just cosmetic or has to do with our particular uh, way of doing business or economics in our world. You know, uh, you can't give money to a chimpanzee because you gotta look at it and say, what is this? What are you giving me? No, I want your banana. I'm giving you some money. You know, I don't think the, the monkey would trade his banana for a little bit of paper. And you go to the ant hole and ask the queen ant, say, look, uh, I'd like some of your food that you, you know, accumulated over time. And again, what are you going to offer them? Bitcoin? Gold? So no, we don't trade with the animals because no animal accepts any of our money of any kind because that's only in particular to our world. But what do we use? What do we use all that money for? To exchange it for food. That's the bottom line. You can do whatever you want, but you can't live without food. Even Bill Gates, you know, with all his money and all these other people, uh, rich people, the Queen of England, they need to eat. Without eating, they're dead. So it doesn't matter how much money they have. If they get stuck on an island, there's no food. They're going to die. And they can have the entire treasure chest in front of them. And all the... Uh, uh, things that they own, all the stock that they own, all the land that they own, it won't help them one bit. What they need at that moment in time is food. And that's all we have. We, what we do every day, whether we know it or not, we're trading money for food. That's it. And then we live another day, and then the next day we do the same thing. <laughs> so, so food is, is the only mechanism that Mother Nature uses to create extinction, mass extinction, by the way, not background extinction. And... Uh, and so when we look at that, uh, we say that all extinctions, all mass extinctions, happen in exactly the same way. It, w w it was when food disappeared that the animals disappeared. Okay? Why did the uh, food disappear? Was it because of some kind of asteroid or maybe volcanic activity or maybe, you know, a, um, a uh, star that exploded nearby, a supernova or something? Uh-uh not the way mother nature works mother nature doesn't use volcanoes or supernovas or asteroids to kill species the way she does it is over time the plants become old their population pyramids overturn they lose their genetic diversity and they go on their way out while a new more uh, vibrant plant uh, plants in, that were in the background, they start covering the land and help to displace the old order. So when the plants are finally gone and the new plants have taken over the land, all the animals that depended on that old source of food, they disappear with the plants that went away. So plants and animals die at what is known as a mass extinction, more or less at the same time. That's the theory, okay? And again, uh, it's got very little to do with uh, Mr. Biden's politics and uh, uh, his uh, threat to sell food to places that were buying it previously from the Russians and the Ukrainians. Okay, so my 10 cents worth. Okay, let's move on to the subject matter today, which is the second, okay? And uh, we have to put it in the proper context, okay? Uh, we're, we're talking about space-time here. We're talking about general relativity. We're talking about mathematical physics. And, of course, uh, time is a very important parameter in mathematical physics. 
And in the case of general relativity, you have space time, which is like the foundation of general relativity, at least. It's the uh, bread and butter, the, uh, you know, the, the, the foundations, okay? And so you have space and time, and time is half of that. I would say it's even more than that, even though you have three, as they say, three dimensions of space and one of time. I think that one of time is a lot more important than the three of space for mathematical physics. Time is the one that they play with. You know, that's the one they put in equations and move around and, and stretch and divide and do all these little things. And we've been doing that at least since the days of the Greek. Okay, so um, time is the most important parameter as far as I'm concerned. You know, that's the way I see space, time, and mathematical physics in general. Time is the key aspect, the key parameter. Okay, so we talked about time the other day, okay, and uh, what was my conclusion? Uh, I ended up approximately in the uh, 19th century. There was really not much in the 19th century. I ended up in the 18th century, actually. But uh, the point is that, you know, until the 18th, 19th century, we had no definition of time. No one could tell you what time is, what it meant, what the word meant. Okay, they could not define the word. And it turns out, as we'll find out today, that even to today, we don't have a definition. We have no idea what time is. Not we, but the mathematicians, meaning that everyone who follows them, which is 99% plus of humanity, also has no idea what time is. Okay, so we have the mathematicians, we have the blind or the one-eyed leading the blind, you know. We have these guys who don't know what time is and everybody else who thinks that they do. <laughs> that's, that's the situation. Okay, so let's do a little brief recap of what I covered the other day so that we put it in the right context. And again, it's got to do with space-time, okay? And uh, this is essentially what I talked about the other day. Uh, Plato, Greek guy, they call him philosophers. I don't think they were philosophers at all, okay? Uh, he said that uh, time is not the same thing as eternity. In fact, they're exact opposites. And you say, well, what? what do you mean, well, Plato? What are you talking about? And yeah, uh, eternity, he says, is the now. Whatever small interval you can make that into, that's eternity. Time, on the other hand, is succession of events. And so time is like involved with motion, whereas eternity is uh, involved with existence. Okay, so he separated time from eternity. <clears throat> and... Um, and yeah, okay, uh, that was his notion. Uh, Aristotle comes later, and he says, uh, was a student of his, right? And he had a different idea. He said, look, uh, time is really not motion, but quantity of motion. Uh, they translate it as number of motion, but to me, number of motion makes no sense. I think he was talking about quantity of motion. And uh, one of the issues there is that, you know, you... you you have to have motion of some kind in order to have time. Uh, you would think that that's the case. And one of the problems I found also with Plato's uh, notion there that eternity is, um, is opposite of time is that eternity is defined as eternal time. <laughs> and so you need to define time before you can talk about eternity. So to say that eternity is the opposite of time, uh, that's like saying black is different than white, but you don't define either one. Okay, so, yeah, we need to define what time is before you can talk about eternity. Then you can say that they're opposites. Well, anyways, Aristotle said that um, time is quantity of motion, okay? And essentially, all the other people that came afterward just repeated what Plato and Aristotle uh, came up with. Uh, you have these three uh, religious folk, uh, St. Augustine, Anselm, and Thomas, Aquinas, right? And they essentially said the same thing. And the, their idea was that God was outside of time. People would ask, you know, uh, how's, uh, uh, how is it that God created time? Like, what happened before then? And so they had to find an answer to that question. They said, look, God is outside of time. You know, God created time itself. God is the God of time. Okay? And... Um, but then, you know, if you ask Augustine, you know, what is time? He says, if I have to explain to someone, you know, I have no idea what it is. You know, he says he knows what it is, but he doesn't, he can't explain what it is. He can't tell you, he can't define the word. And Anselm, you know, he, he comes up with the block universe, okay? Again, he says God is outside of time. He sees 
the past and the present and the future all in one block. Uh, so the block universe that general relativity gives credit to itself for having come up with, no, that, that comes all the way. The idea already was, um, you know, on the books since the days of Anselm. And uh, Thomas just provided corollaries to both Augustine and Anselm, uh, and there's a couple of them. God lives in the now that stands still, <laughs> which is more or less what uh, Plato said. And God doesn't have to dig into his memory. In other words, um, God doesn't have to memorize because he doesn't have to look in his file cabinet to find out what happened in the past. It, he sees it all there in front of him, uh, past, present, and future, all if it were a block. So he doesn't have to look into his memory. That was his notion. But again, you can see these people were just trying to justify that God was outside of time. Because if God was within time, first, he wouldn't be so powerful. And second, if he created time, it would explain why, you know, there was not an infinite amount of time before uh, God uh, created the universe. It's just that God created time. Okay? So that was the notion there. Newton, well, he, he screwed up completely. He writes in his scolium, his famous Principia book, uh, that he's not going to define time because everybody knows what it is. Well, great. He didn't define time, space, or motion because he said everybody already knows what it is, so why am I going to take the trouble? But he had this notion of absolute time that, you know, when you die, time continues. Like there's this time machine in, in the universe that uh, rolls time out, and it doesn't matter what you do, uh, time continues to roll independent of you, okay? So that was the notion he had. That was later on going to be challenged by relativists, okay? Uh, they talked about relativistic time. And, and then you have these two guys in the 18th century, Hume and Kant, okay? And uh, again, you look at them, you find that after so many centuries, they had not uh, zeroed in on the definition of time. Hume says, time is a manner in which some real objects exist, in other words, successively, like one object is just right after another, which doesn't tell us much, okay? And Kant said uh, he, he really addressed a lot of Hume's issues, and he asked the same question that uh, Aristotle began his uh, physics uh, book four with, and that is, is time an entity? Is it a thing? And does it exist? So he asked the same question. He starts out in the same place. Where does he end up? Well, he says time is successive. You know, spaces coexist. So he says that uh, uh, whereas objects can be at the same place, okay, uh, I'm sorry, in the two different places at the same time, time, on the other hand, cannot be at the same time. Time is one right after another. So he was saying that's how time differs from space, okay? Not sure if the uh, relativists will agree with that, but uh, he ends up with this definition. He says, time is pure form of the sensuous intuition, what the hell does that mean? I have no idea, okay? But uh, again, it shows that these people could not define the word time. They had no clue what it is. They died without understanding the word time, and they just rolled along. And today, a lot of people who uh, call themselves philosophers, they study, you know, especially Hume and Kant, and uh, they never picked up on that, the fact that these two individuals never were able to define the word time. So there's nothing to study about Kant and uh, Hume because they cannot define time. So what are you going to study them for? Study someone who can define the word time, then you'll know something about it. And the same with Aristotle and Plato. I mean, what are you going to go and look at their books for if, you know, I mean, I look at them, uh, so I should slap myself. But there's nothing you can learn from them other than, uh, you know, how they reasoned to come up with a no definition or a definition which is unscientific, irrational, because they can't use that definition consistently. So again, you know, why study them other than to know, oh, it's nice, this is what they thought about time. Okay, so what's the issue? The issue is that um, the unit of time is the second, okay? We don't know what time is, but the unit is the second, okay? And a lot of people have this notion that the second, uh, in fact, they explain it. You'll go through the internet and look at maybe 90, 95% of the articles out there, maybe even more. Uh, and they say that the notion of the minutes and seconds came all the way from the Sumerians, uh, Akkadians, uh, I don't know, the uh, Babylonians, Assyrians, you know, Egyptians. Uh, no, those people who say that, 
haven't done a minimum of research and certainly they are not very deep thinkers okay um there was no reason no purpose to using seconds and minutes in days of old you know and uh so the question is uh, what the uh, sumerians came up with was the number 60 the the system based on the number 60. you know they were interested in in numbers like three four 12, 24, 60, those 30, you know, those numbers were important to them and they built this system based on 60 instead of on a decimal system or, you know, uh, uh, tens and hundreds, okay? So their, their notion was 60s. And what did they come up with? Well, they have a couple theories of how they came up with them and it's got nothing to do with a second or with a minute, okay? So that's, that's what I'm trying to say here, okay? And here's a... Uh, summary of that okay uh here's the sumerians okay and originally you know they more or less figured out that the earth orbits uh the sun in about 360 days okay and uh so you know the earth orbit is equal to one degree per day okay they looked at their fingers they said hey this is a good way of um you know, uh, mnemonics to to be able to uh, count and do quick math. And they said, look, if we divide the fingers, the four fingers, right, if we take the thumb out, and you count the uh, phalanges, uh, well, you, you know, you have 12 of them, and so that's a multiple of three and four. And then if you multiply it by the five fingers of your other hand, well, you get 60. And so they started doing all these calculations based on this system. And that's where they came up with a 60. And then they figured out that the, you know, the circumference uh, uh, had 360 degrees. What did that have to do with? Well, maybe, I mean, this is my guess, but I think it all is related. The fact that, you know, the circle, if you take the radius of a circle and uh, you build uh, six uh, equilateral triangles, uh, you can fit them in there, uh, in, in, inside a circle. And so you have six equilateral triangles. They each side of those triangles is the radius. And so, you know, you can see why they started playing around with a number 60 and numbers related to 60. But this has absolutely nothing to do with the second or the minute. Okay. This is what they were using in those days. This this was their clock, okay, which was a sundial. Okay. <laughs> and you can see uh, that uh, it's built in uh units of hours okay you have all these hours there and the hours don't go 24 hours you know they go like from nine in the morning to six in the afternoon so it was when the more or less when the rooster crowed <laughs> to when you punch your card out and that was when you couldn't see anymore out there in the field and there was no use in staying out there you know maybe a lion might pounce on you so you better get out of there so, you know, this is what they were using. And it was a question of hours, not a question of minutes or seconds, not by a long shot. Okay, now later on, they uh, came up with the, um, with, um, the clepsidra, which was a, a, uh, a sand clock, but done with water. Okay, in fact, the water clock uh, preceded the, um, the uh, sand clock, the hourglass. And what was it? So, so they would have this drop fall from one uh, bowl to another. And, uh, you know, that, uh, they more or less had an idea how long it took. Okay, they probably measured it against the sundial during the day. And they said, okay, it takes so much water to fall. And this would be approximately eight hours. And that's what they started using at nights. For what? I don't know. I mean, if you're going to sleep at night, why do you need to know <laughs> what happens every hour, you know? So I don't know exactly why they would uh, control time at night or be interested in that, but apparently they had some use for that. But the issue is it was all hours. It all had to do with hours. The uh, minutes and uh, seconds, they started really coming into use, if not theoretically, but, you know, actual use, in the 16th century, in the second half of the 16th century. That's when they started building some of the clocks, some of the accurate clocks, 
and they started putting the minutes and the seconds, which, by the way, you know, people say, well, why are they called minutes? Why are they called seconds? Well, the minutes, minute, you know, small. It was a, a piece of the hour. Okay, what was a second? Well, it was the second division of the hour. So the first division was the minutes, the minutes, the smalls, okay? And the second division of that was the seconds. That's why they're called seconds. Okay, so you had the seconds, the second division of the hour, okay? That's why, and, and then they put the second hand, okay, in there. And uh, one of the uh, uh, fellows that built clocks in those days was this gentleman here. His name was Joseph Berge. And... You can see the clocks that he made. They were very, very fine clocks. These clocks are, by the way, available today. They're in museums, and they're beautiful clocks. And uh, obviously, the people who bought these were princes. Okay, they, 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 um, uh, in fact, contracted Bergy to build them. Not only Bergy, there were uh, obviously he wasn't the only clock maker in Europe, but he probably is one of the most famous ones because he really built beautiful clocks. And so they. Uh, you know, the princes uh, contracted him to build clocks for them, and you can see they're very fine, uh, built in gold and so on, and, you know, for that you needed uh, someone with money to pay for that. It was a, it was a work of art more than, than just, a, you know, a timekeeping device. But imagine if the prince had this on his bed, his uh, night uh, <laughs> table, you know, it has this little device that measures time accurately to the second and it was quite accurate because apparently it only fell back like one second per day for for that time for the 16th century i think that was very very good okay so they were able to uh, calibrate it to to that level and yeah the princess must have been very happy with with that little device and of course, there are a few clocks uh, in, in general from those days because, you know, it was a very expensive device that only rich people could afford. I mean, if you were poor, you probably got a wooden one and more than likely you didn't get one at all. Okay? People didn't care about time. I mean, the common folk out in the streets, they didn't care about the minutes and seconds. It was only for like, you know, for maybe astronomers, people who were... Uh, the so-called uh, cutting edge of science. Those were probably the people who would be interested in seconds and minutes. And, you know, kings and princes, you know, they, they would say, hey, I'd like to have that device. I can measure, you know, uh, time very accurately. What for? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they would be able to do that. Okay. What happened was, you know, they uh, that was, again, in the 16th century. Now you get to the 17th century. One of the first to uh, make a interesting clock would be Galileo and Galileo built this uh, pendulum clock well he didn't build them sorry he uh, he was blind uh, which was uh, around 1637 1638 and he dictated uh, his uh, idea to his son and his son uh, made the picture the drawing that you see on the left there and it was never built because both of them uh, Galileo and his son died before they could ever build it and today they built it and it does work. So you see it there on the right. So if they would have built it, yeah, it would have worked, okay? And it would have kept time fairly accurately. You know, it was uh, perhaps the first, at least design of the pendulum clock. But the guy who is really credited with inventing the pendulum clock, again, I don't think he should be called the inventor, maybe the guy who built the first one, but not the inventor. Uh, was Huygens, you know, Christian Huygens, he was uh, in Holland, and he built clocks as well, and uh, also, you know, uh, for princes and other rich folk. So he built these clocks, and it's a pendulum clock, okay? And again, uh, it was to track time ever more carefully, more precisely, okay? And so, yeah, time was becoming more and more important, not for the ordinary man, because the ordinary man had no use for seconds. This was only among the rich, maybe, only for interest of some kind. Uh, it's very likely by that time they had already calculated, you know, the, um, the fact that a second was so many uh, portions of the year, okay? So they, they probably figured that out eventually, okay? They did their calculations and were able to figure out 
what portion of a year, first, first divided into months, then into weeks, days, you know, hours, and eventually, to, you know, minutes, and eventually to seconds. And they had to have a good idea how many seconds was in a year. Okay, so they, they started tweaking those numbers. They had an idea, and the second now takes uh, a certain importance, at least in the, you can call it the scientific world, the world of researchers. Okay, okay they started timing things, in other words. Okay, uh, there was an accident that occurred in 1707, uh, a disaster at sea, and it's uh, near the Isle of um, Scilly, uh, <laughs> Scilly Island, okay, and this uh, happened near the, again, it's a British um, military uh, contingent that uh, essentially four of their ships uh, fell as they uh, approached um, uh, England. And the issue was that uh, these people miscalculated their position, their location in the sea. They thought they were uh, where you see the blue dot there, uh, far away from um, the uh, peninsula there that you see, okay, Penzance, and and uh, for those of you who know a little bit of uh, uh, U uh, United Kingdom geography, Penzance is that. Uh, peninsula that you see there and right at the corner of that you see that little island or little sets of island that's the Isle of Scilly and the issue was that they thought they were at the blue dot when in fact uh, they were really at the de at the red dot and they crashed against the rocks four of the ships went down and they lost they don't know exactly but maybe around 2,000 sailors okay and they were coming from um, Gibraltar after a war there against the French for the succession of the Spanish crown, those kinds of things. So what happened was Parliament, um, you know, they put out a little contest and they said, look, a little prize. They said, we're going to give three million bucks. Today's three million bucks, just to give you an idea. Anyone who can figure out longitude, because latitude they could figure out, no problem. But longitude was the, the issue. See, uh, latitude you, you can figure out uh, by using the stars and the sun and all that stuff. So you can more or less guide yourself at, it, during the day and at night. <clears throat> but when you have uh, longitude, you know, uh, east-west direction, now, now what do you do? And there were a couple problems with that. One was that, you know, this, this accident, this disaster. Another one was that um, the way they, the ships would go in those days, People think, well, they just sailed out from Europe and went to America, for example, right? And straight line. And it didn't work that way. The way they did it, they would go north first, following the sun, following the stars, right? Until they reached a region which they already had mapped, and then they would go straight across, okay? And part of the problem with that was that the pirates also knew that. <laughs> they knew the routes. So if you wonder why so many uh, ships, especially Spanish ships, why they were boarded and uh, their loot was uh, taken away, etc., was because the pirates knew the routes. And so th this was another problem. They wanted to get away from, you know, scheduled routes so that they could go any way they wanted. And for that, they needed longitude. And so they, they put out this little contest, this prize money. And one fellow, uh, he came out and he uh, figured out a clock. He was a watchmaker, a clockmaker, and John Harrison was his name. And he came out and he says, okay, look, he came up with this little device, okay? And um, they would take it on ships and they would know uh, more or less the, uh, the longitude. And uh, again, all this measured time to a very, a very accurate uh, very precise uh, level, and uh, he eventually got his prize money, he had to fight for it. Uh, looks like Parliament didn't want to pay him, and it took him some years to get his money, but he got his prize money. But because of that, you know, they, uh, this was a great invention uh, regarding time, because now not only could you measure time precisely on a ship, you know, that's moving around and so on, but on top of that, uh, you were able to... Um, uh, you know, use it to go to through different routes. You didn't have to take the route that you always took. Okay? And and 
because you were able to know how far away you, you were from this place or this other place, you would know if you were going to crash against like the craggy rocks of, uh, of, uh, of this little island there, okay? The Silly Island. In fact, um, if, if you never crashed against the Silly Island, you were not, <laughs> not a sailor, not a captain of a ship, because just about, if you look up the Silly Island, uh, there's been a crash almost every year <laughs> for the last 300 years. You know, everybody's crashed against this island. Okay, um, so what's the story? The story is that, you know, the year is what was used all the way at least till the 19th century, in fact, throughout the 20th century, all the way to 1967, actually, uh, to measure the second, okay? Actually, it was, they measured the year, and they divided it up in all these little pieces, 12 months, 52 weeks, et cetera, et cetera, and you had 31 million, 540, uh, 31 um, a billion, 540 million seconds. That's how much we have in a year. And what is a year? 30 kilometers, okay? What is Bill Gates' uh, definition of time? A comparison of two motions. You're comparing one second, that's your second hand, okay? The second uh, division of the hour, right? Moving one tick mark from one mark to another, that's, we'll call that one second, right? So it moves one second during that time, as we say, right? What are we doing? We're comparing that distance that the uh, hand went from this distance to this distance from one tick mark to the other tick mark and during that period the earth went around the sun 30 kilometers so you're comparing two motions you're comparing the motion of the second hand on your watch to 30 kilometers of the motion of the earth around the sun that's what a second is that's what time is time is a comparison of two motions no one ever figured it out. No one ever had a definition for time. I'm giving you the definition of time, okay? Comparison of two motions. That's all time is. Okay, but uh, did it stay that way? <laughs> well, the 19th century came around, and it was an uh, unfortunate century, especially second half, because uh, the mathematicians started getting more abstract, weirder, okay, crazier. They started inventing things that... Uh, kept them farther and farther away from physics itself. Okay? And they started doing a lot of abstract math and forgetting about physics, which is the opposite of abstract. They're antonyms. Abstract, physics, they're opposite. So if you're doing abstractions, you're not doing physics. You're farther away from physics. Okay? And that's what we have today, abstractions. Okay, so what, what was the uh, issue? Uh, here I showed the other day, okay? where uh, they figured out that uh, time dilated, okay? In other words, they say that if a train goes by a station, we have a difference in views of the observer that's, uh, you know, that's on the platform there and a passenger on the train. And if you have lightning strike the front and the back of the train at the same time, exactly at the same time, these two observers are going to see something different. Okay, one guy, the, the guy on the, on the platform, he's going to see the, both of them strike at the same time because those two rays are going to come directly at him uh, because he's equidistant from both of them. On the other hand, the passenger on the train is moving in the direction of where the front of the train is so th that ray from the front side of the train is going to reach him first before the one from the back of the train. He would conclude that those two lightning bolts did not strike at the same time. Okay, and so what's happened here is uh, now they're introducing the observer into physics. Now we're talking about opinions, what the guy saw. We're, we're having testimony, we're having witnesses, and that's a no-no in science. Science is objective, not subjective. But they introduced in this way subjectivity. Why? Because they were trying to calculate, you know, they're trying to use their equation to calculate what one person would see, what the other person would see when they have uh, relative motion. And uh, one guy credited with that was Lawrence, uh, 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 Lawrence um, uh, a mathematician of the late uh, 19th century. And he was credited with coming up with the Lawrence uh, factor. And what is that? That's that little equation that you see at the top there. And this is how he's going to explain, again, this time dilation 
and they were trying to figure this out partly because of the null or you could say the majority of mathematicians agreed that there was a null uh, result from the uh, Michelson-Morley experiment. In other words, what Michelson and Morley apparently did in, 19, in uh, 1887 is prove to the mathematical crowd that, um, you know, that there is no ether. And so they were trying to address that issue and they ended up with this equation. But this equation is, um, you know, the, the, the guy who's credited with that is Einstein today. He's credited with all this time dilation stuff. Turns out that, you know, uh, Lawrence came uh, up with this equation before Einstein did, and even before Lawrence. We have this other fellow, and uh, his name is Voigt. He's a German fellow, and here's this paper. He wrote it in 1887, when Einstein was only, what, eight years old. You know, Einstein was in his knicker still. And, uh, and this guy wrote this paper in which he's got the main factor, which is the 1 minus v squared over c squared. v squared meaning the velocity, your velocity, the traveler or whoever, right? And c, uh, c squared being the velocity of light squared. And, of course, if v squared approaches c squared, v, v squared over c squared equals 1. 1 minus 1 is 0, and you have division by 0, which is not allowed. Okay? It gives you infinity. So... Uh, you know, so they concluded that, yeah, um, uh, James Maxwell was right. You can't travel faster than the speed of light, essentially, right? And um, this was the equation, I think, the main component of the Lorentz factor. And it came from this guy, Voigt. And it came when Einstein was only eight years old. But Einstein's credited with all this stuff. Now, I don't care about all this, uh, really, because, you know, uh, this is just math. We don't do math in science. We don't do math in physics. It's the mathematicians who incorporate math into physics and into science. Math only describes science, physics, explains. And that's the difference between science and math. Math is just a language. That's all it is. It's a language of descriptions exclusively. It doesn't do anything other than describe. Science, physics, is about explaining. You have to explain what causes gravity. What causes, why does a magnet attract another? This is what you need to explain, okay? and so math helps us not at all uh, in that regard, you know, for that purpose. Okay, so I don't care much about that, who, who was the first. I'm just trying to clarify that Einstein was not the inventor of uh, dilation of any kind. You know, uh, mass dilation, time dilation, length contraction or dilation or whatever, none of that. And that already was there when Einstein was still a kid. Okay, so all I'm saying, you know, we don't agree with dilation of any kind that, uh, you know, that mass contracts, for example, uh, you know, or math expands or anything like or length contracts or length expands. We don't believe in any of that nonsense. Because you have to be irrational to say that because a ruler traveled at the speed of light, it contracted. And then when it stops, it gets bigger again. No, that's got nothing to do with the ruler. It's got to do with the observer and what the observer measures, which is what uh, the Lorentz factor talks about. It has nothing to do with the ruler itself. It has to do with people, with opinions, with witnesses, with what they saw, what they measured. And so you have this debate on whether the contraction is real or not out there. And again, it's got to do with this contraction, with, with this factor that they use to decide mathematically whether something contracted or not. But all that is observer-related. It has to do with measurement, what someone measures, an observer measures. It has nothing to do with the reality of the thing itself. And that's very easily shown that it's nonsense with general relativity, really in this case special relativity, what special relativity proposes. And that is that, you know, the ruler contracts. Well, uh, so did it become shorter? And then suddenly when it arrives at your desk, it grows back again? And you might even say, yeah, that's the case. Okay, well, we'll let it go by. How about mass? Mass increase, right? They say that if you travel close to the speed of light, mass increases. Okay, you got it right? What is mass? Quantity of matter. 
So did we put more atoms? Did the thing accumulate more atoms because it travels close to the speed of light? So the ant turns into an elephant because it travels at the speed of light. It, it accumulated all these new atoms somehow. It increased the number of atoms in its body, became an elephant. And then when it comes to rest, it goes back to being an ant. You know, again, this has to do with the observer, has nothing at all to do with reality of physics, physical reality. Okay, so the nonsense that general relativity proposes, special relativity proposes in this instance, can be, you know, thrown down to the toilet very easily. It's just poppycock. Uh, it has nothing to do with physics. Okay? It has to do with observers and measurement, which is what the mathematicians are interested in, who only describe with equations, and which none of that has anything to do with explaining, you know, how gravity works or how, uh, you know, magnets work or whatever. Okay, so what happened? Well, as a result of this, uh, Einstein was credited with all this stuff, and uh, he began, you know, stretching the second. Okay, so he's saying that now we can stretch and shrink uh, seconds depending on, you know, how fast you travel. You know, so this is what we have today. Nothing has changed in the last hundred years. Uh, that was, uh, what is it, 1915? He wrote his general relativity paper before that, 1908. The, this notion was around already, uh, what is known as relativity or special relativity. And you had people other than Einstein who already had um, come up with this stuff. Somehow they gave the credit to Einstein. Okay. And so, yeah, we have expanding seconds. Now the second stretches. Okay, you can stretch the seconds. Why? Because you travel at the speed of light or whatever. And also because of location. Okay, and so one of the things that the mathematicians do today, they say, this has been proven. We've proven it. Okay, what have you proven? Well, we've proven that, you know, if you take uh, a clock into outer space, it ticks at a different rate and it takes here on the ground. So Einstein predicted that, and so his theory is correct. So he's he's given all these, um, you know, pats in the back. He's given all these kudos. And, you know, we don't need Einstein for that. Uh, we knew that uh, all along for many years that, you know, Mercury, I'm sorry, uh, Mars, uh, takes about twice as long to go around the sun than the Earth. Why? Because it's farther away from the sun. You know, you twirl a ball around your finger, the more, the longer you make the string, the slower it goes. Okay, so did we need Einstein for that? Did we need to run an experiment to prove that? Okay, we already had that idea. But it turns out that Einstein is wrong anyways. I mean, his theory is complete bunk, and it's very easily debunked. And I debunk it here you know, very easily, okay, and the idea is that they have today is that if you take a clock and you take it into outer space, okay, that clock should um, run faster. And if you take it down on Earth, right at sea level, for example, it should run slower. Why? Because gravity has an effect on the clock that's close to sea level. Okay, so this clock has the pull of gravity; it goes slower. Okay. And the clock that's out there, because it's farther away from gravity, gravity doesn't have the same influence over it, it goes faster. And they say, we've proven it. We've taken clocks out there and we've proven it. Well, maybe, just maybe, they didn't take the right clock. I mean, if you're going to talk about time in relation to gravity, you got to take a gravitational clock, not the uh, atomic clock. Atomic clocks are not gravitational clocks. They have to do with the wave, you know, the how many blips, you know, for example, cesium uh, wave has, has nothing to do with gravity per se, okay? And so what we do is we do it with a, a gravitational clock, okay? And here's the most, uh, probably the best gravitational clock that you'll find. You can buy it at the 10 cent store, okay? And it's a known as an hourglass. It's the clock that works exclusively because of gravity. So that's the best uh, clock to test it with. Now you take a cesium clock, right? Uh, watch, a <laughs> wristwatch. You take it out there and it's going to distort time anyways. Because again, if, um, if, if it's at sea level, it has a different 
rate than if it's out there in the sky or in the or in space. So we have no accurate clocks if we're going to talk about accuracy. All clocks dilate. <laughs> okay, so all there's not a clock that will mark steadily the same time uh, at different uh, regions of space. Okay, or, in, or uh, you know different heights above sea level or above the center of gravity of the Earth. Uh, and so we take our little hourglass and we show that it's the opposite. It's not that uh, the clock is faster at, uh, you know, out there in space. It's quite the opposite. It runs slower. And if you take that same clock, a gravitational clock known as an hourglass, right, and you take it to, to sea level, that clock will run faster because it's closer to gravity and the grains are going to come out of the uh, little glass container there is going to come out faster. Okay, so uh, our clock proves general relativity wrong because it's the, it has the opposite effect of what they predict, as it's known. They call it a prediction. Well, here's a prediction, you know. I'll say that my clock runs faster when it's at sea level than when it's out there in the middle of nowhere. In fact, if you take it farther out, not a single grain will fall. And according to the uh, lunatics of relativity, they would say that time has stopped because they decide everything by measurement. And now if not a single grain falls because there is no gravity out there, they say, well, time has stopped. That's what they would conclude. That's their rationale. That's the way a mathematician thinks. He says, oh, it goes slower, slower, slower. And when it goes out there where there's no <laughs> gravity, they say, oh, it stopped altogether. So now time is not longer no longer flowing slowly. Now it's stopped altogether. <laughs> so that's the mathematical mind, how they think. Okay, but not only did they stretch the second, dilate it and do all these fancy things, they also chopped it into pieces. They chopped the second. They weren't, they weren't satisfied with, you know, with uh, just the second. Okay, they had to, because see, uh, until the 20th century, at least, most of the 20th century, uh, they were just dealing with seconds, but after that, they invented the millisecond and the microsecond and the picosecond. Now we're talking about portions of a second. You know, they keep going, they're, they're going to end up with no second at all. I mean, you know, they're going to end up with zero second, and they're going to say, well, what do we call this one? The, the uh, second that's approaching zero, almost touching zero? I don't know what they're going to call it. The second is disappearing, folks, and that's dangerous because once it disappears, we, we have no time, okay? But they invented chronons, and what is a chronon? Well, this is where you gotta, you know, hold on to a seat because you might fall and break your neck, okay? The chronon is a particle of time. It's like if you take the second and turn it into a ball, and so now you have a ball of second. <laughs> the second is a ball, okay? What is this uh, chronon? Well, here you have a definition, okay? It goes something like this. It says, a chronon is a quantum of time, the smallest discrete and indivisible unit of time, okay? So it's, we're talking about a portion of time, okay? A unit of time. So far, it looks like they're just talking about numbers, right? You say, okay, take the number line, you chop off the five, it's just the number, okay? So far, so good. Uh, what's the hypothesis? Time is not continuous. Well, Aristotle would have a problem with that because for Aristotle, continuous was exactly the opposite of what they define there. In other words, continuous was something that you could chop. That's what he called continuous. Otherwise, it was not continuous. You figure that out from good old Airy, okay? But that's, that's the notion he had of continuity. But anyway, it says, in a one-dimensional model, one-dimensional model, what are they talking about? One dimension, a little stick? No, they're talking about an itinerary. They call itineraries dimensions in the religion of mathematics. Okay, so whenever they say dimension, they're talking about itineraries. They're talking about, especially one-dimensional, right? Because they're talking about an itinerary traced by whatever object. They don't care about the object. They don't care if it's three-dimensional. But they look at the itineraries. It's a one-dimensional itinerary, trajectory, or path or whatever. Okay, so they're saying a one-dimensional model, meaning a one itinerary model, huh? a chronon is a time interval or period. Okay, 
is a non-decomposable, well, while in an n-dimensional model, it's a uh, non-decomposable region in n-dimensional time, okay? What are they talking about? Well, they're saying they've got all these little chronons that form part of this dimension. I thought dimensions were used to, in, in the context of objects. So now they're saying, well, we have the length. We're going to chop the length, which is a piece of that object, I guess, right? So we're talking about a little particle, right? And that's exactly what it is. It's a quantum of time, okay? But they're saying that time itself, remember time in general relativity at least, is a physical object. It's, it's that portion that, together with space, forms the container in which we live, which we inhabit, okay? We live in this container known as space-time. What is uh, gravity? Well, it's the warpage of time, okay? You have the Earth pushing against this depression, which is time, okay? It, time is being warped by the sun, pushing down on the space time, meaning you're warping time, and that's the explanation they give you for why the Earth cannot leave the solar system, because somehow it comes up against this curved wall of time. And so time is a physical object. And they're going to go in there and they're going to take a quantum of time. They're going to take a little bit of that, and they're going to say that's the chronon. So now we have a chronon, which is a little particle of time. Everything is particles in, in mathematics. They have no, never proposed anything outside of particles. Okay? What's a particle? Well, who knows? It's certainly not the corpuscle of old, of what is known as classical physics, okay? classical mechanics. Okay, so we have this. Um, not only have we stretched the second, we have chopped it up, and we've converted it into a little ball called the chronon. Okay? So, so we have all these notions, and the question is, you know, can you define a second? Can you define time? No, you can't define either because they made a complete mess of it. <laughs> That's why you can't define it anymore. It's beyond rationality now. You know, if, if you chop the second to little pieces until you get the pico second and who knows what else continues, the terra second, you know, and that's on the one hand. And on the other, you stretch it, you say, well, but it's traveling at the speed of light, so now it's stretched. Okay, and uh, or compressed or whatever, right? And then and then uh, you have um, uh, uh, then you have it turned into a ball because now they have the chronon, which is a particle of time, a quantum, a, a chunk of time. What is time? Time is this thing that forms space time, which is a curved wall against which the Earth lies. You know, as it rolls around, as it orbits the sun. So you have this whole mess. And so, yeah, you can't define time, you can't define the second under those uh, assumptions or those theories. You know, if those are the theories you're going to subscribe to, how are you going to define time now? How are you going to define the second? Well, yeah, they have no idea. So what they do is they define the second, you know, longer, no longer it's a piece of the orbit of the Earth, 31 uh, billion, 540, I think it was, uh, million seconds. No, it's no longer that. Now, and that would have been quite accurate, but now they have it, this, this atomic clock that measures, you know, the, the uh, second. They look at the, how many vibrations a cesium wave has, and they call that a second. So many trillion vibrations, they say that's a second. But you take that clock into outer space and you have a totally different reading. See, that doesn't happen with the Earth. The Earth is constantly going around the sun more or less at the same rate. But the cesium clock, you know, if you take it out of a certain sea level, out of a certain temperature, at a certain distance from gravity, you know, et cetera, all bets are off. Then you have a totally different reading. In fact, someone calculated, I was looking at a calculation there, that fellow says that if you take the uh, atomic clock, the cesium clock, right, and you put that same clock uh, on the moon, on the surface of the moon, it would uh, be different than the one on Earth by 21 seconds. I think it was per hour that guy calculated or something like that. So it would be off by 21 seconds. And so, you know, it's an inaccurate clock because it depends on where it's at in the universe. And so that's not an accurate clock. 
I think a much more accurate clock is the Earth going around the sun, which is quite reliable, you know, at least so far until an asteroid hits us or whatever and causes our extinction, right? Okay, um, so this is what they, um, they have today. This is the, uh, we've replaced the orbit of the Earth around the sun with this contraption. They're, they made more uh, user-friendly contraptions since then. This was probably one of the first ones that looked like that. It was a big thing. Today they have it made smaller. But they have these atomic clocks. They put them on the satellites and they control GPS, okay, uh, by trilateration, okay. Okay, so uh, um, what's what's the deal? Well, here's, here's the conclusion of all this so that, see if we can recap uh, what the second is, what time is, okay? And these are my conclusions. Relativity is based on space time. That means time is very important, very important uh, leg of general relativity, which is the, you know, the current catechism in mathematical physics, so-called, called also physics, erroneously called physics, also called science, again, erroneously called science, None of this has anything to do with science whatsoever uh, because science explains and these guys, they describe with equations which could be correct, we don't care about that, but then the explanation they give is totally irrational and that's what we look at. We look at what's your mechanism for gravity? What's your mechanism for uh, attraction of two magnets? What is your mechanism for electricity and the workings of the atom? That's what we're interested in and you will never get it from mathematical physics in general and relativity in particular. Okay, um, no definition of time today. We have none today. Maybe next time. <laughs> yeah, we have no definition of the word time. And these are some of the definitions you'll find out there. I just put three out there, but you'll find more similar to these. What are clock measures or reads? Okay, what's a clock? Well, a clock is what measures or reads time. <laughs> so, we don't know what, a, what it's measuring, you know, uh, what do you mean what a clock measures, you know, measuring a horse while it runs, I mean, we don't know what a clock measures. Okay, the continued sequence of existence and events. The continued sequence, one thing right after another. Well, that could be locations, one location after another in, uh, you know, uh, something that's moving. Is, is that time? Okay, we have uh, one... Uh, like you, you take uh, a movie, right? And you look at the frames of the movie, and here you have the horse in one location, another location, another location, no, another location. Well, you have the sequence of existence. Is that time? Is if that's all that God made out there, you know, just a, you know, a horse at different locations? Is that time, or is that just motion? So no, uh, that definition is obviously wrong. A measure of, of non-stop, <laughs> measure of non-stop, uh, consistent change, of non-stop consistent change. Again, you know, if something changes, is that time or is that just motion? The word change is a synonym of motion, not of time. Okay. For time, you need memory. You need to memorize the locations of the two objects which you are comparing, uh, that are moving, and with, uh, whose motions you are comparing. That's what time is. And so you need memory. Without memory, you have no time. Okay, so that's very important. Anyways, the second is only 400 years old. It's not 2,500 years old, as you'll see throughout the internet. All these people are just parroting what other people say and just put it in there, say, oh, the 60 seconds came from the uh, Assyrians or the Sumerians or whatever. No. The 60, the 60 system came from them, not the second or the minute. That came only about 400 years ago. Okay? So that's a new invention. It's uh, still in its infancy, you could say. And it's already about to die. Uh, I guess uh, what I call it uh, when they uh, grow old very suddenly, those babies. Uh, can't remember the name of the disease. Anyways, uh, yeah, this is a baby that's already grown very old very suddenly. Uh, the second has been stretched and partitioned. So, you know, if you stretch it, do you still have a second? If you cut it into pieces, do you have a second? 
if you turn it into a ball, do you have a second? I mean, we've lost all track of what a second is right now. And they say, well, we measure it with the cesium wave, you know, vibrations. But you take that out into outer space, it has a different reading. So what's a second? We have no idea. We don't have a definition for it. And we don't know what it is because, again, you know, if they say it's the so many vibrations of the cesium, well, you take it out there, it has a different reading. That means you have to specify more conditions, meaning at what latitude, at what temperature, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, it's very, very, you know, you got to be very precise on, on what you mean by the second today. And you can't really define it uh, except with putting so many of these parameters in there. Okay. Once you take it a little bit farther higher, farther lower, all bets are off. Okay, uh, they morphed it into a particle. The famous chronon is now the new particle of time. And it's interesting that it forms uh, part of space-time because if a chronon is for real, if, if that quantum of time is going to form part of space-time, it forms part of the canvas, okay? And if it forms part of the canvas because it prevents the Earth from flying out of the solar system, well, then you're talking about a real physical entity. We're not talking about an abstraction anymore. Now we're talking about a ball. These people are saying that, you know, this, uh, this phonon, uh, pho uh, I'm sorry, this chronon uh, is part of space-time. And because it's part of this uh, canvas, the fishnet, right, maybe... Where, where the fishnet, where the little strings of the fishnet cross, maybe those are the uh, chronons, right? Because it's it's a little ball that forms part of the fishnet, we're talking about a real object. You cannot l later on wish it away and say, well, we were, you don't, you're not supposed to take it literally. You're not supposed to take the analogy literally. No, no, what they're describing is a physical object. They're saying the chronon is a ball, a ball, this ball is part of space-time. It forms one second, or maybe a millisecond, maybe a microsecond, or a terasecond. You know, who knows what. But it forms a part of a physical object that prevents the Earth from flying out of the solar system. How am I supposed to interpret that as an abstraction? The Earth is for real. And so if something is holding it in its orbit around the sun, what is it? What physical entity is it? And these people are saying it's space-time. What is space-time made out of? Made out of chronons. Okay, let's uh, move on to some of the questions and comments people made. Fellow says, says, because the time and space are concepts, okay, because time and space are concepts, okay, there is no need for a rope to connect two atoms. Okay, I don't know where he got that from or what his line of reasoning is, if you can call it reasoning. The rope would therefore have to be what? A concept as well as existing within the concept of space and time. A concept that exists. You see what happens when people don't define the terms? So, so the, this fellow is talking about an existing concept, a concept that exists. No such monster in science. Okay? Concepts do not exist in science. Objects can only be said to exist. And so this is one of the problems that you have when people don't define their terms. The fellow continues, the only logical conclusion, logical, he thinks he's logical, he thinks he's rational, is that in the present there is no separation between matter and all matter is one. He's saying there is no separation of matter. This is his logical conclusion. And all matter is one. And they have in the block universe or the cubic universe or whatever. Separation can only exist with concepts of time and space. So he's going to use time and space to divide, but he says the only conclusion is that there is no separation. He went around in circles like 10 times there. So the question to him is, if there is no separation okay, between matter and that all matter is actually one, he's talking about a, something that's made out of a single piece talking about an object that is made out of a single piece, in this case a cube. And the question is, what are all those galaxies and stars and planets inside that cube? 
How come they're separate? How come I can distinguish a galaxy from a star, a star from a planet, a planet from an asteroid, and so on down the line from a gas molecule or whatever? I can distinguish them because somehow they're partitioned or separated from the next guy over. If they're separated, obviously something is chiseling them apart, and we call that space. And so he, can, he said the only logical conclusion is that there is no separation between matter and all matter is one. And again, it's because uh, people like him don't define their terms and they just use terms of ordinary speech and they bring him into science indiscriminately. They don't even pay attention. They don't even know what they said. This is the problem. So that's why when you come into physics, when you come into science, you have to be very, very careful with definitions. And we are very careful here. And people don't like that. They say, oh, you redefine the term. Well, yeah, we redefine terms. We've been redefining terms for the last 2,000 years. Did you just find out about that? We constantly define terms, redefine terms, whenever we see the need to redefine them. And if you have an irrational definition, that is okay in ordinary speech, but you cannot bring it into science because you cannot use it consistently, then you have to redefine the term. And the way it works, one guy defines, the other guy doesn't like it because it destroys his religion, Hey, he's got a single uh, recourse, and that is to bring a definition that he can defend. He gets inside the ring with sword and shield and defends his definition. And it doesn't work like a lot of people like to do. They say, well, that's the way we've always used it. Or all the mathematicians voted for it. Well, I don't care if they all voted for the flat earth. You know, Mother Nature doesn't care about that. So we don't care if all mathematicians uh, voted for a... a theory or for a definition or for a mechanism if it's irrational and Mother Nature doesn't approve of it, okay? So it doesn't matter if all of them vote, which we call democracy. It doesn't matter if they got it from a book that's been around for a hundred years. We don't care about tradition or, you know, any other argument of that nature. No, you, you, there's only one way, and that is for you to come up with a definition and be able to defend it from any attack that people raise against it then you have a solid definition. Okay, that's how it works in science. Okay, here um, another fellow says, time is change or the interval of change. Okay, uh, change is motion. Motion is not time. They're not identical. You have to have two motions, comparing two motions in order to have time. You can have change in motion and not necessarily have yet time okay and it says or the interval change again it's irrelevant uh, it, change is not a synonym of time change is a synonym of motion you need two changes two motions in order to have time you need memory also okay Einstein general theory of relativity established time as a physical thing he's absolutely right there okay he said time is a physical thing that's what Einstein essentially uh, determined Okay, he turned it into a solid, okay, so to speak. Maybe it's uh, fluid, maybe bendable a little bit, you know, maybe not completely solid. But yeah, he turned it into a thing. It is part of space-time. He's totally right there. The gravitational field warps space-time. Okay, we got, on the one hand, he said it right. That's what uh, mathematical physics says. That's what um, general relativity says. But then uh, we have a problem with the word field, because field is not a physical object. You cannot say that the concept, um, uh, time, uh, the, let's say, the concept love warps the concept intelligence, or vice versa, intelligence warping love. Uh, what sense does that make? And that's what you're saying when you say that a field, which is a concept, warps time, which is a concept, okay? or space-time, which is another concept. So you cannot say, because if you look up the word field, it says a value at each location around an object. That's what a field is. So we have a bunch of numbers, a bunch of values, you know, numbers and units. And what general relativity says is that uh, these numbers warp a physical object, which is not one, but they treat it as a physical object, which is space-time. So yeah, we have a problem here because the physical interpretation of this is nonsense. It's poppycock. Has no uh, place in science. Okay? 
Time can appear to move faster or slower. Whoa, yeah, when, when I have 10 beers, time goes very fast or slow. Drives me nuts, you know, so I try not to drink too much because otherwise time flows faster or beyond me and I can't catch up with it. Yeah, time is not a physical object, but if you treat it as a physical object, then you talk about it moving slow or fast. If time is a concept, you can't talk about it moving at all, let alone fast or slow. Time passes. Yeah, it just passed me by. Whew. Very fast. Time passes more slowly close to a massive body. Uh, but see, uh, with the, with the uh, hourglass, it's the other way around. Uh, so this is nonsense from general relativity. No, time goes faster uh, close to gravity. Uh, and you can prove it to yourself. Take a... Um, an hourglass, uh, you could take a water clock, you know, clepsydra, and uh, and just put it there and then take it into outer space or somewhere very far, maybe to a mountain high above sea level. And that one should go slower than the guy that's close to the sea level. So uh, Einstein's wrong. I don't know where Einstein got this nonsense that all clocks, you know, runs uh, slower or faster at different heights. He's got it in reverse, you know, for some clocks at least, okay? Time dilation isn't just theoretical. Whoa, okay? So, uh, yeah, what do you mean not theoretical? If it's not theoretical, what is it? You mean like what? And it says, an hour, and I put that at the, t at the pub, is equivalent to seven years in space. That I believe. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I give faith, yeah, yeah. When you're at the pub for one hour, it's like seven years in space. Yeah, some of these folks, and they believe all this stuff, you know, a lot of them. Um, they cannot explain it, but they believe in it. Okay, here we have another fellow, I think. Uh, what is time, someone asked. And I asked that, in fact. I said, what is time? That was the previous uh, lecture. The fellow says, a concept. Correct. That's all it is, just a concept. Another fellow answers him, says, concept, an abstract idea, a general notion. He got this from the dictionary, apparently, because obviously it's nonsense what he, what he put there. And he says to the first guy, he says, are you sure that you want stick with saying time is only a thought in the mind, an abstract idea? And you look up idea, it says, any conception, concept, okay? A thought, conception, or notion. What is notion, conception, or idea? So all we had so far are synonyms. None of what this fellow put are definitions that we can use in science because they're all circular definitions known as a synonym. Antonyms are also circular definitions. You can't say dog is not a horse. Uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> it's not a whale, not a bird, uh, you know, so, so we don't use antonyms. We don't use synonyms to define words scientifically. Okay, uh, another comment. Can you quote uh, one of these scientists who say particles come out of nothing, please? Well, uh, one fellow, Brian Cox, he's a pretty famous guy. He's got some, his name in lights out there, and you can look him up. He's British, right? Um, Brian Cox says that they come from the fourth dimension. These uh, gravitons, he says they come from the fourth dimension. So that's, I mean, saying that it comes from the fourth dimension is putting outside beyond your reach. So you can say, well, how can I find, what can I, how can I verify that? Or whatever? It's in the fourth dimension. You can't get to it. And so that's a good way of putting it beyond your reach. It's like saying, well, what about God? Well, God is beyond your reach. Well, how can I reach God? I, I want to see him, touch him. And they said, you know, you, you must pray and, and believe and have faith. And this is more or less the same thing. It comes from the fourth dimension. But, okay, so that's one answer. But the majority say it comes from the vacuum. And you can look up Larry Krauss, another popular guy. And he's got a, a book. And uh, he's got also a couple YouTube videos. A universe from nothing. Okay, so particles come out of nothing. Forget about particles. An entire universe, they say, comes out of nothing. And um, uh, I think I have here, no, anyways, the deal is that, you know, um, lots of people talk about universes 
coming out of nothing and particles coming out of nothing. In fact, all of quantum mechanics talks about, uh, you know, particles appearing from the void, that they ran all kinds of experiments. And you don't have to ask me, just look it up on the internet. I mean, all you'll find is that. So to ask me to come up with an example, like saying, can you find at least one example? Hey, go on the internet and put the question there. You'll find millions of examples where everyone in quantum mechanics says that particles appear from the void. They pop in from the void. Okay, and uh, among them, I've talked about all this in the past, but uh, you have uh, the direct C, you know, particles uh, that appear from nothingness. In other words, it's saying that the vacuum itself, known as the ether, right? is uh, built of negative and positive uh, particles. You know, that's, that's what he came up with, and that's what we have today. We have these virtual particles. What are virtual particles? Well, virtual particles are particles that appear out of nothing. So look up the virtual particle, and you'll find out. You don't have to ask me this question, because uh, it's not that, like, I invented it, or I'm coming up with something, you know, out of nowhere. Uh, you just look it up on the Internet, and you'll find out that particles come out of nowhere everywhere in quantum mechanics. That's a done deal. And what are particles? Well, they're wave functions. So, <laughs> so that's another issue. Okay, fellow says, the antidote for Christianity is literacy. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with him, you know. Um, but, you know, some people are literate in the sense that they know how to read. So you would have to really define what literacy is, okay? Uh, some people are well-educated. In fact, um, uh, there was one British fellow that... Um, uh, was interviewed. Uh, he was a physicist, and he believes in God. And I'm sure there's many of them out there, mathematical physicists, who vouch for God, who believe in God. Maybe they have their own God in a different way than what is known out there. But yeah, they, uh, they're, you can say they're literate, and they still believe in God. So I don't think that literacy, unless you define literacy very well, I'm not sure you can say that... Um, Literacy is what determines uh, Christianity. Okay? You have people who are literate in many ways and they still believe in God or use God as a, um, as a foundation for physics in their minds. Okay, okay. Uh, fellow says, a scientific explanation theory right, is the presentation of objects and movements of those objects, a mechanism, that the presenter posits could have resulted in the set of observed phenomena for which an explanation is. And yeah, that's a pretty good summary. Uh, we subscribe to this notion of what science is. It's just uh, explanation, uh, rational explanation. Uh, if it's irrational, it's not an explanation at all. And that's what a theory is, an explanation. So yeah, I pretty much subscribe to what this fellow said. At least that's what we... Uh, push for in this channel. Okay, so yeah, 100 points there from ours to you, right? And final issue, fellow says, black hole. The term black holes alone should raise doubts because a hole is by definition not black. And if it is a hole, what can be seen behind it? Because you're looking at a hole, you got to see something behind it. That's what he says, right? Nothing. Because a hole is just a round or square border of an object, but is, the, but is the universe an object? Because you should be able to see the universe right through the hole. But he's saying, what do you see? Well, you see nothing because there is no hole. <laughs> okay? The universe must be an object, right? Because if you see something through the hole, then the universe has to be an object. It has to be a thing, right? Because that is exactly what is indirectly claimed if you... Think through black hole properly. Yeah, if you can see, like, there you have the famous black hole that they say they proved, okay, which is not a black hole. Uh, they qualify that, and they say, well, it's not actually a black hole. It's um, matter rushing into a black hole, and it creates this image, which they took with many, uh, from many regions, took many shots. It's a composite, right? They built this. So you have to understand what this image really represents and what it is is according to them okay it's just matter falling into a black hole what you're looking at is uh the drain in your sink okay you turn on the faucet right the water rushes out it twirls around okay that's what you're seeing here the twirling around 
and it falls inside the drain, which is the black hole. Okay, that's the analogy. Okay, but uh, what you're seeing there is not the black hole, not the drain. You're not seeing the drain. What you're seeing there, the whole thing that you're seeing there is just all this um, water swirling around, falling into a black hole, which is zero dimensional. There's nothing there. Black hole is zero dimensional. There is no length, width, or height in a singularity. And uh, you say, Bill, you're inventing all this stuff. Where did you get this nonsense? Blah, blah, blah. Don't take my word for it. Okay, go and find out what uh, Chandrasekhar won his Nobel Prize for. He won it for proving that a black hole a star, right, collapses to zero D, zero dimensions. He won the Nobel Prize for proving that a star can collapse to zero size. You hearing me, listening to me? He won that Nobel Prize for that. And if you don't want to look that up, you can look up um, Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time, okay, where uh, I think 1987. And in his book, he tells you that Chandrasekhar proved that a black hole singularity, right, is zero dimensional. There's nothing uh, there. You can't peep through that hole because it's so small that it's nothing. You're looking at space itself. That's what Chandra Sekhar won his Nobel Prize for. A lot of people have problems saying, no, no, Bill, it's not zero dimensional. It's approaching uh, no size. No, no, no. There's no reason for it to approach no size. It goes all the way and becomes no size. And the funny part about that is that, you know, it crushes all matter out of existence. If it crushes all matter out of existence and mass is the quantity of matter, there is no matter, there is no mass, and so a black hole is not only zero-dimensional, but it's massless. I'll see you on Wednesday.